You know, the part of Saul's story that I struggle with the most is when God takes his spirit away from Saul, and then further, God gives him this unruly spirit, a bad spirit. I feel as though I can relate to Saul, and that scares me. I mean, Saul knows he's been chosen by God, he had that confirmed in miraculous ways, but still, Saul is arrogant, tyrannical, and foolish. So in response, does God take his spirit away from Saul because Saul is a foolish person? I'm sometimes foolish. Maybe I make too much of the story, but I actually think it's key to understanding the entire story of Saul. In fact, it may help us understand the entire biblical epic and further help us uncover how God taking his spirit from Saul is actually an integral part of God's good news. This is Bible Unbound, where we help you understand the Bible by uncovering the gospel in every biblical story. Let's explore. One way to make sense of the entire Bible is to read it looking out for archetypes. An archetype is a recurrent symbol or motif in literature, and oftentimes, authors will use people as archetypes to convey an idea. And the biblical authors are no different. And theologians for centuries have been pointing out this very reality. Can you guess where Saul's archetype starts? We can easily trace the story of Saul all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where we meet a cursed snake. The snake is an interesting figure whose history will remain unknown to us. However, in the ancient world, snakes were often symbols of powerful evil forces that opposed kings and queens. While the snake is more than a symbol in the biblical epic, we do get the same picture here, and that's no coincidence. In the language of Genesis, we see that this snake is a kind of anti-king who rules over an anti-kingdom, a kingdom opposed to God's magnanimity. However, the snake does not oppose God. The snake opposes God's appointed rulers, humanity. The snake is an anti-ruler who opposes not God, but Adam. In relation to God, the snake is merely another created being who will one day give God all the glory that God deserves. That is why God curses this creature to crawl on his belly. It's a symbol of total submission, and the snake's curse to eat dust is to say nothing of his dietary restrictions, but rather, this is a way to communicate that the snake is cast out to the outer banks of the wilderness. You see, as Martin Luther will say, the devil is God's devil. And we see that right there in Genesis 3. So see this too. When Adam and Eve choose the fruit of knowing good and bad, they effectively transfer kingdoms. In the first kingdom, they were rulers with God. In the second kingdom, they become slaves to the anti -world. That's why we see the snake come up again in Egypt as a powerful and oppressive pharaoh. Pharaoh is not God's opposition, remember, but rather Pharaoh opposes God's people. God has an authoritative control over Pharaoh and his heart, just like how God has a governing control over the snake. And so now we meet Saul. Saul was born about four miles north of Jerusalem in a town called Gibeah to a man named Kish of the tribe of Benjamin. Saul is searching for some lost donkeys like animals without a proper shepherd to care for them. What an accurate picture. So Kish said to Saul, take one of the young men with you and arise. Go and look for the donkeys. However, after three long days searching throughout the hill country, the donkeys are nowhere to be found. Saul suggests that he and his servant give up. He's worried that his father might think they're dead. That's when his servant suggests that they put their trust in the God who knows all things. You see, the servant suggests they go and see a prophet in the town that they're in, and his name is Samuel. Now, instead of being worried about what his father might do to him, Saul becomes anxious over what Samuel might do to them if they don't come bearing gifts. 
but persuaded by the servant, they head off to Samuel. Meanwhile, the people of Israel have become restless. Recently, a series of unprovoked military conflicts coupled with internal afflictions has made the people upset. They no longer trust in God to rule over them. Like the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness that wanted to go back to Pharaoh, or Adam and Eve themselves, the people of Israel demand that they get a new king. That way, as the Israelites say, they will be just like all of the surrounding nations. So Samuel goes and inquires of God of who might be made king. God has determined to give the people over to what they desire. So God has elected Saul to be king. God tells Samuel that on this day, a Benjaminite will come looking for him. He is to be the first king over Israel. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. So Saul and his servants stay with Samuel for some days. When they were going down to the outskirts of the city, and Samuel then said to Saul, Tell the servant to pass on before us. And when he has passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? And you shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. Then Samuel gives Saul very specific instructions. Saul is to wait for Samuel at Gilgal, where Samuel will offer special sacrifices on behalf of Saul and the kingdom. However, when Saul turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart, likely meaning that Saul had other ideas about how he would rule. Well, all these signs came to pass that day. When they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God rushed upon Saul, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And a man of the place answered, And who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? A sign that Saul would have never been caught dead mixing with the religious before. This idiom is said when someone does something radically out of character. And so we see. After all these things, Samuel called the entire people of Israel to gather at Mitzpah. Here, the anointing of Saul was going to be confirmed by the casting of lots. It's an ancient practice to determine the will of the gods, or in this case, the one true God. When Samuel had gathered everyone together, he said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today, you have rejected your God, who saves you from all your calamities and distresses. And you have said to him, Set a king over us! Now therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. When the lot fell to Saul, he was nowhere to be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, Is there a man still to come? But the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. They then ran and took him from his anxious hiding spot. Saul's reign begins in a state of fear, distrust, and disillusionment. He will reign for forty years under nearly the same pretenses, his new heart becoming harder and harder with each turn. Right away, we find that Saul's kingship is to be focused on his military might. He leads a series of violent campaigns to fantastic success, fulfilling the words of Samuel from chapter 8. The king will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands, commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war in the equipments of his chariots. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But 
You see, when Saul was appointed to meet with Samuel and Gilgal, as Samuel had demanded be done before, Saul becomes filled with anxiety when Samuel doesn't show up. Saul then offers sacrifices on behalf of himself, impurely, and as an unclean, sinful, and anxious man. Meanwhile, his son Jonathan has been stirring up trouble against the Philistines, ancient enemies of the Israelite people. Saul chooses for himself an army of choice men in direct contradiction of the laws of the kings in Deuteronomy. Therefore, Samuel says to Saul, You have done foolishly, which is a strong condemnation in the biblical narrative for someone who is not only intellectually lacking, but morally and ethically lacking as well. Samuel says, You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be the prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And they both leave in a rage. Saul then continues his unlawful and immoral campaigns against the Philistine nation. When after a hard day of battlement, Saul demands the army fast from food until I am avenged on my enemies, he said. It's almost as though Saul were turning into a demanding, enslaving, unruly pharaoh. The weariness of the day drives the army to the brink of death, and the fighting is not even over. They take the rotting carcasses of the animals and eat them in direct violation of Levitical law. Meanwhile, Saul's own son Jonathan dips his staff in honey and forsakes the fast himself. The knife twists into the spiritual chest of Saul when he gets a command direct from God to defeat the Amalekites in response to their violent oppression of Israel from Exodus chapter 17. However, Saul does not listen. Not only does he spare the very king of Amalek, effectively making the war for nothing, but he also offers their own cattle on the altar of the living God in direct disobedience to his commands. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel, and he said, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. The cosmic king of the universe is grieved over the fact that another person has chosen to side with the anti-prince, the ruler of the principalities of the air. Although God knew that Saul would side with the very force that opposes human flourishing, God did need a way to bring his anointed ruler into the world. So God is grieved like he was grieved when he banishes out Adam and Eve. God is grieved like when he exiles the Israelites. God is grieved in the same way that he is grieved today when humanity forsakes him for their own selfish pleasure and destruction. In fact, God is so grieved that he has a plan to redeem all of creation. He is so grieved that he will allow nothing to stop this plan. Not sin, not death, nor rulers, nor principalities, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all of creation will stop this God from bringing justice to his good creation. When Samuel finds out about all of the injustices that Saul had done, he effectually, though not literally, banishes him from his role as king. An act of justice on behalf of Saul and mercy on behalf of the nation. For if God was a God of injustice, he would have let the nation be ruled by the snake. And this is when, in a small Bethlehem field, a bushy-haired ten-year-old boy, who is passionately enamored with God, is met by the prophet and priest Samuel, an anointed king over all of Israel. In an act of justice, God has anointed a new king, meaning that his spirit is now resting on a boy in the image of Abel. God's spirit has departed from Saul, and a spirit more in line with who Saul worships takes its place. After all, the devil is God's devil, 
Saul's heart is in God's hand, and it is only just to give Saul over to what he worships. Ironically, this bad spirit is what puts Saul back into God's presence. If God's presence is now resting on David, Saul hires David to play music for him when he's restless. But it only serves to harden his heart more, just like Pharaoh. His vexation begins to turn to torment when David is proven to have more faith than Saul in battle, and Saul can't take the pressure. His only way out is to kill the servant boy, David. His multiple attempts on David's life fail. David goes into hiding and Saul chases him around, just like how the snake in the garden now roams to and fro around the earth, searching for God's people. When Saul discovers that the priest at Nob, Ahimelech, has spared David's life, Saul kills the entire company of priests. Only one son of Ahimelech escapes, Abiathar. But David remains alive. So Saul hunts David to Keilah, where he hopes to trap him. But Abiathar warns David, and David flees again. He runs to Ziph, where the Ziphites sell him out, and Saul chases him to Maon. When at Maon, Saul learns of an attacking Philistine army. David escapes to En Gedi. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. On the way, Saul happens to relieve himself in the cleft of a rock, which just so happens to be the very cave that David is hiding in. David has every chance to kill the king of evil, the snake, but he feels that it is an injustice to take God's vengeance into his own hands. Instead, David spares Saul's life. And then Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And though Saul goes home, he will never truly repent. For this is not the last time that Saul will seek David's life. Shortly after Samuel's death, Saul is alerted again as to David's whereabouts. Saul does not come unprepared. He picks 3,000 choice men to hunt and kill the anointed son of Jesse. But while Saul is asleep, David slips into the camp and spares Saul's life once again. This compels Saul to fully put an end to his hunt for his successor's life before he dies. Saul had been a defeated man from the beginning. He now accepts this fate as reality, and he goes home to continue his war with the Philistines. While David was in hiding again, unsure of Saul's true disposition, the Philistine army gathers their forces for war against Israel. When Saul saw the army, he became terrified, true to form, of his anxious and sinful heart that has not once placed his trust in the God who anointed him. Furthermore, instead of seeking God's guidance on this matter, Saul goes to a necromancer, a medium, and demands that she recall Samuel from the dead. And in an odd scene, a spirit does appear before Saul. Whether this was Samuel or not, we can never truly say. But Saul seems to think that it is. The spirit prophesies that Saul will die in the coming battle. And on the following day, three of Saul's sons were killed, including Jonathan. Saul became very badly wounded, and he commands his armor bearer to kill him. But when the servant refuses, Saul falls on his own sword and ends his life. Saul's grandson, Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, remained alive, as did Ishbosheth, Saul's heir, and finally Abner commander of Saul's army, all left to lead the Israelite forces in the wake of Saul's death. Seeing the story of Saul all laid out like that really helped me. What we see is that Saul is a lot like 
many who came before him. On the one hand, Saul is like the unruly and evil Pharaoh. He's conniving and coercing like the snake. He represents all that Israel desired, a strong, militaristic king, though unjust as he was. Saul is the kind of person who opposes God, his people, and all that God stands for. But on the other hand, Saul does not sink nearly quite to the depths of someone like Pharaoh. In fact, in many ways, he parallels David. Both men are fearful, worrisome men who, and oftentimes, do not trust God when it's needed most. In fact, what we may see is that the story of Saul and the story of David really tell us the same thing. It creates, deep within us, a yearning for a new kingdom. Saul is indeed like many who came before him. In fact, what we see in the story is that Saul is exactly like a person. You see, we often forget that God is not dealing with a neutral humanity here. The natural disposition of the human heart is to reject God as king and further, to overthrow him. So how is a good, righteous, just, and holy God going to bring his anointed, messianic king through the rebellious and violent humanity? Well, he's going to send his spirit to accomplish his means. And like many that came before him, Saul receives God's Holy Spirit. And like many that came before him, Saul loses God's Holy Spirit. And that's right. Many that came before Saul also lost God's Spirit. This is because throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit comes upon people to accomplish God's plans for salvation. Now, before you go and get your pitchforks, or worse yet, click away, Hear me out. As New Testament scholar Michelle Lee Barnwell notes, God's Spirit rushes upon the Israelites Aholiab and Bezalel to construct the tabernacle in Exodus 31. The Holy Spirit anoints 70 elders of the Israelite nation to prophetically announce the Lord's arrival and then leaves them in Numbers 11. God's Spirit also comes and goes upon many judges, like Gideon and Samson. This is because God's Spirit comes upon people to accomplish a specific task in human history, and this has actually not changed. The Church has been anointed with God's Holy Spirit to accomplish a specific task. It's the task of building a living tabernacle, like Peter says. It's the job of proclaiming God's arrival in Jesus Christ, like Paul notes. It's the work of sanctifying the elect in order that they may be holy and righteous, like God is holy and righteous, like James says. Only this time, this work is its so magnificent, so powerful, so all-encompassing, that God's Spirit refuses to leave those he comes upon today. He has taken the curse of sin upon himself, dying on a tree, so that we may never experience the dark depths of hell, the dark depths of being separated from his presence, like Christ did when he died. The prophet Joel proclaims this very reality in the second chapter of his book, when on the day of the Lord, God will pour out his spirit. And in those days, Joel says, all will be made new. And in those days, Joel says, God will indwell his people, never leaving them, sealing them for the day of the Lord. The apostle Peter then proclaims that that day is the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. That great and powerful day when the Lord will never leave his people is today. Yes, the story of Saul also has many messy themes like the tension between God's infinite mercy and his infinite justice and how they cannot contradict one another. But those themes may be better seen elsewhere. For now, church, just know this. The story of Saul, like the story of David, 
makes us yearn for a greater kingdom, a kingdom that is here today. God has moved heaven and earth, sun and moon, space and time, so that you can witness that day around you, the day when he will never leave you. This was Bible Unbound. We'll see you next time. Hey, Bible Unbound, thank you so much for enjoying this Bible Unbound video. You know, Bible Unbound has a vision to see this kind of gospel-centered biblical content available to everyone for free. Unfortunately, it costs a hefty sum to produce. Fortunately, however, the Lord knew how the world worked, and he's given us a vision to accomplish this task in his word. You see, in Acts chapter 4, the church lacked nothing because they shared everything. And so if you want to get in on this mission of uncovering the gospel in every biblical story, you can go to patreon.com slash Bible Unbound and help support this vision and this mission today. That way, all of our videos will not have AdSense on them. It won't cost money to buy this Bible in a Sentence booklet, and the gospel will be available to everyone for free. Again, you can support this mission at patreon.com slash Bible Unbound. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time.